All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at some ways of studying the effects of hazards. So first of all, toxicologists study effects in several major ways. One of them is they do wildlife toxicology studies. So that would be an example like with DDT to discover that DDT was affecting the shells of birds. And human epidemiological, so let's say that together, epidemiological studies, which are like long-term studies, for example, comparing smokers versus non-smokers over their lifetime. And dose response studies in the lab, which are often done with lab rats. So try this question. Uh-oh, did I give you the answer already? Oops. Um, so which takes the longest time? And the answer, of course, is human epidemiological studies, because they follow humans over decades. Dose response studies can be done with lab animals in less than a year. So here's a picture of the, some bird eggs. Correlate the chemical presence and its effect on animals in the field. Example, DDT. And human epidemiolo epidemiology relies on case histories. So observing an analysis of individual patients, for example, someone who is exposed to a toxin, you kind of follow them for the next 10 years or so and see how it affects them. And those epidemiological studies, long-term, large-scale comparisons of different groups of people. Example, comparing smokers versus non-smokers. So one example of that would be the Mad Hatters, who used mercury to make felt for hats back around you know, 100 years ago. And they would go crazy because mercury is a heavy metal neurotoxin. Some advantages are that they are realistic these studies and all real life factors are included. But the disadvantages is that they have statistical correlation only. It does not prove causation. And in other words, um, just because you see that, um, well, in the case of the mercury, knowing that people that work in felt factories are exposed to mercury and they're kind of crazy, does that necessarily prove that it's mercury making them crazy? Maybe there's some other thing about their work environment that can, is making them crazy. So um, we have to, just because there's a correlation doesn't necessarily mean that the two are, that one is causing the other. They could both have some independent um, outside cause. And it can take long times to get these results. That's the other disadvantage. Dose response analysis is a little bit more precise and quick. And it's where we have a method of determining toxicity of a substance by measuring the response to different doses. Lab animals are used. Mice and rats breed quickly, so that's an advantage. And they give data relevant to humans because they are mammals like us. But as we, will, as we see from some of the data in assignment 8.4, um, there's differences even between how mice and rats compare to each other in their response to a toxin. So what does that say about human response? How similar is it going to be? And these responses to doses are plotted on a dose response curve. So let's take a look at one of those. This is kind of like what we did in class. Dose on the horizontal, response. In this case, the response we're looking at is um, death. And we're trying to figure out something called the LD50. Usually there's a threshold, um, or oftentimes there is, where you won't see any effect, any death, until it reaches a certain concentration of, or a certain dose. And anything above that will cause a response. And this number that's um, a common statistic for chemicals is what is the LD50, meaning what dose will cause death in 50% of the test animals. And so what you do is you find your 50% mark, you go all the way across, and then you drop down and you see, oh, this dose will make half of them die. And a substance with a higher LD50 is actually less toxic because it means it takes a higher dose of it to kill half of the test, species, test organisms. Whereas a chemical that is le um, more toxic will have a smaller LD50. It won't take as much of a dose to cause 50% to die. So try this question here. For a new insecticide, the LD50 dosage level for rats is measured to be 150 milligrams per kilogram. On the basis of this information, one can conclude that... Go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. Let's take a look at your results. So C is correct. And I want to point out here, 50% of any rat population will be sickened. If that said die, then that would be a correct statement. Um, there is something called the TD, the toxic dose 50, 
which is just seeing what those people show um, uh, show some sort of sickness. 50% of any mammal population, that's not true. We're only looking at rats here. And But what you can say is 500 out of the 1,000. That you can say because you're comparing rats to rats. And for D, um, the answer is that it would actually be more toxic if it has a... Um, it, yes. Oops. Um, this is wrong. If it has an LD, if it has a higher dosage, then it would take less of it. Oh wait, <laughs> I'm getting, I'm confusing you and myself. If this is a higher number, LD50, that means it takes more of it to cause lethality. That means it is less toxic. So this should say less toxic. And it is less toxic, toxic to humans than an insecticide. Um, what we're saying there is sorry guys I think something got cut off on that answer choice let's move on which describes the ideal pesticide go ahead and pause okay welcome back so um, we would want to have what happened there okay we would want to have a pesticide that is very specific to one type of pest so that's not killing off the good and the bad bugs. Um, broad spectrum would mean that it kills um, a greater variety of bugs and that's not really good. Um, because it might mean that you're killing your ladybugs <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> at the same time that you're killing your aphids. And you want it to have low environmental persistence. That means that it will break down you know, pretty quickly in the environment rather than sticking around for decades and bioaccumulating into organisms. Um, and of course, high environmental persistence, that means it lasts for a long time. We don't want that. Bioaccumulates, we don't want that either. That also would mean it's leading to long-term health issues. We would want one that does not bioaccumulate, has low environmental persistence, and is specific to one type of pest or a small variety of types of pests. All right, so dose response curve, a little more information here. Usually the response increases with the dose, but this is not always the case. And with endocrine disruption, it may actually decrease as the body's defense system begins to recognize it as foreign and thus combat it. So what I mean by that is these endocrine disruptors can, can um, tweak our body at very low concentrations, so low that they often go under the radar. But if the concentrations get high enough, then our immune system would be like, whoa, what's this? And begin to break it down as a toxin in the liver, etc. So asthma, developed from living with mold in your house, and this is an example of what kind of a hazard. And this would be a multiple mark. Go ahead and pause. Okay, welcome back. I hope you recognize it's a biological hazard because it is a fungus. And this would be a case of chronic exposure. You're exposed to it day in and day out over months or years, as opposed to acute exposure, which means like you walk into some place and get blasted with some chemical. And not all people are equal. Sen sensitivity to the toxicant can vary with sex, age, weight, etc. And babies and older people or those in poor health are more sensitive. Um, babies because they put things in their mouth, they breathe more, their immune systems are still developing, and they themselves are also developing. So if you make changes to some of the stem cells in their body that haven't yet differentiated into their, you know, whatever structure they become, then you're going to see some kind of mutations and things like that. So we already talked about acute versus chronic. And this is a good time to talk about synergism, which is similar to drug interactions. If you're taking more than one medication, your pharmacist should think about how do those medications interact with each other in your body. We never do this when we're looking at the effects of chemicals in our body. But sometimes some substances together can make worse effects. And uh, this is the case of one plus one does not equal two. One plus one might equal three or four. And these are called synergistic effects. And it's a challenge, challenging problem for toxicology because there really is no way to test all possible combinations. Um, and of course, the other part is the environment contains complex mixtures of many toxicants. Okay, so a little bit about here about risk perception. Um, 
the main point here is that oftentimes people really don't clearly perceive actual risks. And one example of that is, do you think it'd be safer to drive cross country to New York City or to fly there? Most people would say that there's more inherent risk in getting on an airplane, maybe five miles or even higher, eight miles, maybe not that quite that high, six miles off the ground. And traveling at 550 miles an hour sounds pretty scary to me. But um, we can see here that airplane accidents versus automobile accidents, you're almost, gosh, almost 100 times more likely, um, well, at least 50 times more likely to die in an automobile accident. Even comparing being overweight by 15% compared to being in an airplane accident, most people would probably say that it'd be safer to be overweight by 15%, but now we are talking about 200 times more, uh, more risk. And when we do risk management, um, that's a little breakdown. We're doing what's called cost-benefit analysis. What level of risk will we accept for some benefit? And um, give you an example. Asbestos is a great flame retardant, but it is also a carcinogen. Should we use it to prevent building fires? You're going to save some people from not burning up, but you're going to be killing some people with cancer. There are two basic philosophical approaches to risk management. One is called innocent until proven guilty, where you are assuming the substance is harmless until shown to be harmful. And the other one is the opposite, called the precautionary principle. You assume it's harmful until it shows to be harmless. And here's a little breakdown of the two, side-by-side -side comparison. Of course, industry has pressured governments to take an innocent until proven guilty approach. That way they can more quickly get their product to market. But environmental advocates have pressured government to follow the precautionary principle because it just makes more sense if you're trying to be safe. Which government agency is responsible for making sure that pesticides applied to crops are safe? This is multiple choice. Go ahead and pause. All right, welcome back. Let's take a look at your answer. So um, the correct answer is D, the Environmental Protection Agency. They test anything pollution related. If you thought Food and Drug Administration, well, they test food additives, things that you might actually put into your food and, and purposely put into your mouth, like um, new artificial flavors. But pesticides are presumed to be washed off before eating, so they don't count. And OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they would test whether the farm workers are being protected during pesticide application. So they're testing the people whose occupation it is to apply them. You should know the, the basic um, key federal agencies here. Food and Drug, they regulate food additives, cosmetics, drugs, medical devices. EPA, pesticides, industrial chemicals, and any synthetic chemicals not covered by other agencies. And OSHA, workplace hazards. So which of the following best describes the EPA's approach to regulating new chemicals? What do you think it would be? All right, so definitely innocent until proven guilty. The quickest way to get a new product to market. And they, their approach also is to rely primarily on manufacturer safety tests, which are obviously biased, although not completely, as they don't want a bunch of future lawsuits. Um, but they don't really have the time and the resources to do their own independent testing, unless they need to as follow-up from other company tests. And last part here, uh, the EPA, is charged with monitoring 75,000 industrial chemicals. This is too many chemicals and too little time, people, and resources. And only about 10% of chemicals on the market are thoroughly tested. 2% are screened for being carcinogens, mutagens, teratogens, and less than 1% are actually government regulated. And 0% are tested for endocrine, nervous, or immune effects. And none are tested for synergistic effects. All right, everybody, that's a wrap for this uh, unit. So. Ask any questions, come see me in my room, and I'll see you later.